you are come to the um, seventh lecture series of our um, econometrics for finance that is think six five four and then here we're going to look at volatility models so we look at how you can model the dynamics of the um, fluctuations in a series the dynamics of the fluctuations in a series so um, as again my name is um, Dr. Lord Mesa and then uh, UGBS affiliated and then uh, my email address is lordmesa at ug.edu.gh now this session we model financial time series by capturing the volatility clustering so you you can have a series where um, kind of uh, higher fluctuations will follow higher fluctuations and then also when this fluctuation settles it follows by you know lower fluctuations so that is how the series behave and how do you capture this and that is a condition in time series where bigger shocks tends to um, for be followed by big shocks in both directions and um, smaller shocks tend to follow smaller shocks so that is clustering in, uh, in the series so the key topics to be covered in the session are as follows we have the characteristics of stochastic processes we have the arch and gash models. These are models that captures this uh, volatility clusterings. And then the likelihood ratio test of the how the volatility evolves. Again, the reading materials, you can see we're still using uh, Brooks Introductory Econometrics for Finance as uh, Cambridge um, at price. And then we have the William Green Econometric Analysis then other materials that you can use to support it and how much it is purely of um, time series. So the characteristics of a stochastic processors. Now the motivation here is that we have a linear structural models and cannot explain a number of important features common to the financial data. So here the data has um, a fat tail that is the leptoketosis, then it will be difficult to um, capture the dynamics because all the models that we've done so far are purely time series that does not capture just dynamics and then we have the volatility clustering or volatility pooling where we have um, smaller shocks followed by smaller shocks and then bigger shocks then we can also have leverage effect leverage effect so our traditional structure models could be something like this and this is what we know for now as we speak with it multivariate um, structural model and then more compactly it can be represented by this where x is a matrix and then b is a vector of the parameters mu is the error vector and we also assume that mu is normally distributed with expectation of zero and a constant um, variance so this is a typical return series of the s p 500 from January 1990 to December 1999. A sample of financial asset returns time series. What do you see here? Look at this. Look at the dynamics. You realize that when the series indicates higher fluctuations, it follows higher fluctuations. And then when the series tries to settle, there's kind of tranquility in this part. It follows what kind of the fluctuation reduces. And then over here, when so that movement, how do you capture it? So that is what the dynamics in the volatility. How do you capture it? So this is a depiction of the volatility um, clustering um, movement. So Campbell, Lowe, and McKinley, 1997, define a nonlinear data generating process as one that can be written as. Now, what we see here. We see the series yt as a function of some error term with their lags. Okay, some error term where mu t is what an iid that is identically independent distributed error term, and f is what a nonlinear function. So f can pick a nonlinear um, values of the variables that we have in there. So they, are, they also give a slightly more specific, specific definition as a situation where yt so can depend on some error term, which is iid, the lags of it, 
and then the error term times what a constant function variance okay so that is where g is a function of past error terms and only uh, sigma which is a variance step so the models with nonlinear g dots so that's the g function are nonlinear in mean okay whereas those with nonlinear sigma dot are nonlinear in variance so does series has what two part the series yt has part which is nonlinear in mean and then nonlinear in what variance okay so the series has two parts we have the nonlinear in mean and the nonlinear in the variance so the linear paradigm is a useful one and then many apparently nonlinear relationships can be made linear by suitable transformation so you can also do kind of a transformation other than on the other hand it is likely that many relationships in finance are what implicitly nonlinear so if it's nonlinear what are the models that will capture this nonlinearity in the models so in the series so there are many types of nonlinear models that we are going to consider so we consider in this case we're going to look at the ash and the gas models that's the focus of this lecture and then switching models okay and then bilinear models but then we're looking at the ash and the gas models in this case so the traditional tools for a time series analysis which we know of is um, autocorrelation function uh, spectral analysis may find no evidence that we could use a, a linear model okay we find no evidence but the data may still not be what independent so a portmanteau test for nonlinear dependence have been developed and it's the ramsey's reset test so all this all what this does is that after your regression you have to regress the error terms on the fitted dependent variables okay and this is a way of testing whether your model is linear or not in a simple case okay in a simple case so if it happens that um, the joint values of b1 b2 b3 up to bp turns out to be different from zero then it means there is non-linearity in your series so one particular non-linear model that has proved very useful in finance is the ash model which came from angel 1982 an example of a structural model is of this form so we have a structural model that is what the more multiple regression model which we have the dependent variable depending on about four of the variables and then we have some error term which is mu t okay some error term now with error term being normally distributed with expected value zero and then sigma mu as the constant so the assumption that the variance of the errors is constant is known as what homoscedasticity so the variance is constant now the question is what if the variance of the errors is not constant we have a situation of heteroscedasticity how do we capture it if it's not constant then it could be what non-linear so would imply that the standard error estimate could be what wrong if it happens like that and is the variance of the errors likely to be constant over time not for what financial data it's not always because if you look at the series that we indicated earlier you look at the spikes the variance varies over time we have a place where the variance is high variations are high and then we have a point where the variations are low okay so that those variations does not happen so if it sorry happens in financial data so it tells you that the variance are not what constant okay so use a model which does not assume that the variance is what constant so we recall the definition of the variance of what mu t now this is the variance definition so we we, we, we compute sigma t as the variance of mu t given some information at the lax okay so we use a mu t minus one mu t minus two up to some value 
which is mu t minus possibly t minus capital t minus one so this is what the variance square deviation from the mean okay deviation of the individual observations from what the mean given some information but mind you this part is zero because the mu is what white noise and it has what expectation of zero so if it turns out to be zero then we are only taking a square of this okay so in the end we have sigma t equals to var of mu t and then the squares of that because as i told you the expectation is what zero so given some information that is um the data we have or the estimated error terms so what could be the current value of the variance of the errors possibly depend upon so if you look at it carefully it would depend on previous squared error terms so previous squared error terms okay and then this leads to the autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic model okay and that is what we call the arch model the what the arch model for the variance of the error term so you can see it here the current value of the variance which is sigma t depends on some constant plus what alpha one and then the lax of what the error terms the lax of the error terms so this is known as what the arch one because we went only by what one lag okay only by one lag so we call it what arch one current variance okay of the error term depends on the lags of the residuals now mind you the residuals was obtained from an estimation of what a multiple regression model okay so we embed this into a multiple regression model to capture the dynamics of the residual because the residual will not have a constant variance as it is presumed by the classical linear regression model assumptions so the full model will be we have the multiple regression model okay the multiple regression model now when we estimate the multiple regression model we have the um, error term now the assumption is that the error term is normally distributed with mean and then sigma now this is not constant now it varies with time that's why you can see sigma t here okay the variation is what varies with time so that's why you can see sigma t here so if it varies with, with time then what is the model that will capture its variations this is the model this is the arch model that can what capture its variation so we can easily extend this to the general case where the error term the error variance depends on q lags of squared errors so you can see we have up to q other so this is kind of what q other lags. so that becomes an arch q an arch q so instead of calling the variance sigma t in some textbooks usually you will see ht instead of what sigma squared t so if you see ht is um, the same as q so the model which is the the multiple regression model the assumption this sigma t so it's no more a constant and if it's not a constant this is the model that captures its flow captures its flow so how do you test for arch effect how do you test for arch effect so you first run a postulated linear regression of the form given in the equation so this is a linear regression model okay that's a linear regression model and then you save the residuals okay you save the residuals then square the residuals and regress them on q own lags to test for arch effect so here the no hypothesis is going to be um gamma one gamma two gamma three or equal to zero if it turns out to be zero that means there's no relationship between what the residuals and then what it lags okay so the presence of arch is not there so obtain r square from this regression so this is kind of an auxiliary regression okay this is an auxiliary regression where you regret the residuals on what it lags so obtain r square from this regression 
the test characteristic is defined as what t times r so when you obtain the r square you multiply it by what the sample size okay you multiply it by the sample size which is the t the number of observations multiplied by the coefficient of multiple correlation so from the last regression and is distributed as a chi-square with q as a degree of freedom and q is the order of the oscillatory regression so that's um, the order of the oscillatory regression so the null hypothesis and the alternate is stated as we can see here gamma naught as i stated earlier gamma naught sorry gamma one equals to gamma naught that means there is no relationship and alternatively there is a relationship so if the value of the test axis is greater than the critical value from the chi-square distribution then reject what the null hypothesis that there is no relationship that means the um, error term has what has a constant variance okay but if it happens that there's a relationship then the error term has no what constant variance so note that the arch test is also sometimes applied directly to returns instead of what the residuals from the regression okay so instead of capturing the residuals from the regression you can do the test on the um, returns now the returns sometimes they, they show a sign of what um, inconsistent uh, volatility where the volatility is not constant so how do we decide on Q that is a problem so problems with arch models how do you decide on Q okay how do you decide on the lags if you are testing how do you decide on the lags and the required value of Q might be very large sometimes and then also with it's an assumption on the alpha so we have alpha naught and then alpha one which is the coefficient and it has to be non-negative number so the non-negativity constraint might be sometimes violated in the arch models so when we estimate an arch model we require that what alpha i which is alpha naught and then what alpha one alpha one being the coefficient alpha not being the constant are all greater than what zero so in the end one for i running from one to what q since variance cannot be negative okay we expect this condition to hold variance can never be negative so we expect this condition to hold so a natural extension of an arch model which gets around the problem of non-negativity of the constant is the gash generalized arch model the generalized arch model so that was introduced by angel and bullish left okay so they introduced this uh, gas model so due to bullish left 1986 allow the conditional variance to be dependent upon what previous own lags that is allowed so they introduce some new term okay a new term what is that new term it's just the lags of what the conditional variance which are computed from the lags of the error term okay so as you generate a series you take the lags of the um, conditional variance itself if we are moving because uh, we going back for only one lag okay we call it what uh, gash one one okay model gash one one model so, and it looks like an armor model okay an armor model in the sense that we have the error part of it and then we have the series it's lag in there so there's an auto regression in the conditional variance itself which is this one um, which is the um, sigma t minus one and there's an auto regression in some noise somewhere okay so that is what like an amma one model for the variance equation so we could also write alpha t minus one so it's just a matter of moving one step behind okay moving two step behind and then we keep on doing some substitutions okay we keep on doing some substitutions and then in the end we're going to have the equation in this form right and so an infinite number of successive substitution you end up eliminating all the lags of the variance okay so you end up having the lags of now you can see here we have a constant 
mu alpha 1 mu t minus 1 all squared. And then this is a constant. It will go off. So the gas 1, 1 model can be rewritten as an infinite gas model. So if the, we, we do an infinite substitution of the ash models into the gas, we're going to get what? Finite, infinite what? Ash. Okay. So the gas 1, 1 is nothing but the ash model with infinite order. The ash model with infinite order. So in the end, we have the ash model, the gas model capturing most of the financial series. Now you can go to, we can generalize it to gas PQ, where P can pick any positive number. Q can also pick any positive, depending on the order. Okay. So we can extend the gas 1 1 model to gas PQ. So we have an expansionary form of what? The gas 1 1 model. And you can see we have the order of what? The um, error term and then the order of the variance PQ. Okay. So in a compressed form using the summation sign. But in general, a gas 1 1 model will be sufficient to capture the volatility clustering in data. So most of the time you see people doing different types of gas, gas 2, 2, trying to just um, test. These are inbuilt in software. So you can easily manipulate the order that you want to operate in. Okay. But as far as the literature is concerned, most of the time the gas 1, 1, the simplest one can easily capture this dynamics in the volatility clustering. So why is gas better than ash? It's more pars parsimonious, okay? It's more parsimonious, avoids overfitting, less likely to breach the non-negativity constraint, but still, it's less likely. So there's a somehow probability that it will breach that uh, constraint. So there is still an improvement on that. So unconditional variance under the um, gas specification the unconditional variance of mu t is given by base values. Now you can see here, this is just a constant in the gas equation. This is alpha 1. Now on condition that anytime you finish computing the um, gas model, we expect that the coefficient in front of the, um, the variance and then the error term, sum of it, will be less than 1. If it doesn't turn out to be less than 1, we say that it is what? Non-stationary. That process is non-stationary and invariant. So, and then if it turns out to be equal to exactly one, then the term is integrated gas model. We have the integrated gas. So for non-stationarity in the variance, the conditional variance forecast will not converge on their unconditional value as the horizon increases. So since the model is no longer of usual linear form, we cannot use what? OLS to um, estimate the parameters. So we use another technique known as what? Maximum likelihood approach. Now, the word works by finding the most likely values of the parameters given the actual data. So all that you're going to do is to, to, to create a function and then find the most likely values in that function. So more specifically, we form a log likelihood function and maximize it. We maximize the log likelihood function. So the steps involved in actually is, is in uh, actually estimating an arch or gas model are as follows. One, specify the appropriate equation for the mean and then the variance. So we specify the appropriate equation for the mean. Now we assume that yt, which is the data itself, okay, has a process which evolves around its mean, which is a scalar, and then its lags, which is autoregressive with lag one, and some error term, okay, autoregressive with lag one and some error term. This error term is not constant, it varies. So if it varies, then the, that is the variance of the error term. It varies. So if it varies, then what is the dynamic of the that uh, variations? And we use what as one one, gas one one to capture that dynamic. So in that that variance will depend on its lag and the lag of the residuals in there. So we specify the log likelihood function to maximize. 
Now, what would be the log likelihood function? We are saying it is normally distributed. Okay. And generically, we know what a normal distribution is. So if it's 1 over um, 2 pi times what? Sigma. That's the standard deviation. Square root. All right. And then e to the power um, x minus its mean. The observations minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Okay. So if I take each observation and then combine them together, I will get this kind of uh, equation. That means if I have 2 pi um, sigma and I toss it up, it becomes an inverse, isn't it? And then I affect the logarithm, it becomes addition. Okay? So in simple way, then one of them will be constant, the 2 pi. Okay? So in a way, this would be the log likelihood function. Okay, the log likelihood function is simple. I mean, when you fit the logarithm, you have 1 over 2 pi sigma or square root. So when you send that up, it will be 2 pi sigma to the power minus half, isn't it? The square root minus half by your uh, small indices. Okay. And then you take the 2 pi is a constant. All right. And then if you sum it across, if you take logarithm, you will get what? Half in front of it. So the half, which is exponent, will become negative half in front of it. Then if you take it across all the observations, you're going to have logarithm 2 pi and then t of that because you have t observations. Okay? And then you have the sigma part, which will be the sum. Here you've sum it already. That's why you're going to get t times 2 pi. Okay? But the t is a scalar. So... Then you have a logarithm of sigma t. And then the series minus what? The average is what you have here. That's um, this. Okay. So in the end, you have that divided by the sigma t. And half is already there because it's e to the power. So when you affect the logarithm, that base, logarithm, the, the logarithm with base e, okay, that part will go off. So the computer will maximize the function and give the parameters their standard errors. So where do we find the maximum function here? At the maximum, this function has to be zero, the gradient. Okay. So this is more or less a quadratic function. So consider a bivariate situation where we have a regression with homoscedastic errors for simplicity. Okay for simplicity. So we have this equation. This is a kind of a bivariate uh, regression. So assuming that mu t is what? N is normally distributed with mean zero and then variance sigma. And you know, there's a difference because here the sigma is not normally, it's not um, time varying, okay? It's not time varying. So then we have yt equals to the value of the expected. So if you take the expectation, this part will be zero. So that will be the expectation and then sigma. So that the probability density function for a normally distributed random variable with this mean and variance is given by huh, this is a normal distribution. Look at it. You see? This is a normal distribution taking the average and all those. But here, if you send this up, okay, it's going to be um, 2 pi to the power minus what half okay and this is minus 1 all right so then you take the effect across now successive values of yt will trace out the familiar bell shaped which is the normal distribution assuming that mu t are iid then yt will be what iid because it's yt is mu t that determines what the movement of yt T. Okay. So then the joint PDF for all the Ys can be expressed as a product of the individual density functions. So we have the individual observation density functions. You have observation 1, observation 2, up to observation what? T. So the likely distribution of the individual observations gives you what? A product. Okay. So this is what? The product sign from 1 to what? T. Okay, and substituting into equation two for every yt from equation one, we simplify it and we have this equation 
which is the normal distribution. So the typical situation we have is that the X, T, and Y, T are given. And we want to what? Estimate B1, which is one of the parameters, B2, and then the sigma, which is the variance. So if this is the case, then F dot, which is a function, is known as the likelihood function and is denoted having what? The parameters of interest as B1, B2, and then the what? Sigma. So we write this function. So these are the parameters of interest b1 b2 and then what sigma so why how do we find the six, six sigma now the maximum likelihood estimation involves choosing parameter values b1 b2 b3 that maximizes this function that will maximize this function so we want to differentiate for which is this equation the maximum likelihood function with respect to b1 b2 the parameters but 4 is a product containing t terms. So how do we differentiate it? So since the maximum of any function is the same as what? The maximum of the logarithm of that function. This is a calculus relation. Okay. We can take logarithms of what? 4. That is to linearize it. Okay. So then using the various laws of transformation functions containing logarithms, we obtain the log likelihood function, which is of this form. So we realize that because the previous equation is nonlinear, we've linearized it now. And now we can apply our differentiation okay, to find where the function will be zero, which is equivalent to that. So differentiative five with respect to B1, B2, B3, we obtain this, this relationship. So what do we see here? We found B1 to be equal to Y hat and then B2 X bar. And this is more or less an OLS estimate. Okay. So this is the process. We differentiate, which is where we have three equations with three unknowns. Okay. Three equations with three unknowns. And setting six and eight to zero to minimize the functions and putting hat above the parameters to denote the maximum likelihood estimators. We have one b1 to be that we have b2 to be the um, slope coefficient and then we have the sigma which is of that okay and if you compare this to ols it's the same estimate that we are talking about but then there's a difference in terms of the sigma so how do this formula compare with the ols estimators we're talking about nine to what ten uh, identical to ols 11 is different. The OLS estimators was that, okay? We subtract the degree of freedom, okay, in the previous case. Therefore, the maximum likelihood estimator of the variance of the disturbance is what? Biased, okay? It's biased. Although it is what? Consistent. But how does this help us in estimating heteroscedasticity models? So since the gas model has, was developed, a huge number of what extensions and variants have been what proposed. Now, as you can see, we, 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 we mentioned some caveat in the gas models. So the three of the most important examples are the E-gas, the GJR, and the gas in mean. Gas in mean. We'll go through them for you to see what they are. So problems with gas PQO models are that one, the non-negativity constraint may still be what violated okay may still be violated and then the gas models cannot account for leverage effect now the leverage effect being in a sense that if there is no we are talking about dynamics in our uh, volatility so if there is a deeper um, um volatility and then the next step it sinks again okay this gas model it's not able to capture that movement. So the, there is an improvement in the gas model that can capture it. So the possible solutions, the exponential gas, that is E-gas model, or the GJR model, which are symmetric gas models, captures this caveat, okay? It's able to captures, capture this caveat. Now, this is the E-gas model introduced by Nelson, okay? Now, as you can see here, 
we still have the gas component okay where we have the log of what the lags of what the um the sigma okay and then we have the mu and by here you can have absolute value here now this part captures the leverage effect of the equation so the advantages of the model is that since we model the logs of the variance the conditional variance then even if the parameters are negative the conditional variance square will be what positive so in this end the constraint will be what eliminated okay now we can account for the leverage effect if the relationship between the volatility and returns is negative that is the um, gamma part will be negative and where is the gamma part this part is the gamma part so the gamma part will be negative so that is the e gas model it's a modification of the gas model okay now all the parameters that we find in there are measurable you can easily measure them so omega is a constant then we have the gj gjr model that is glostin jonathan jaka nathan and then ronkel's model now all that they did was that in order to capture the leverage effect they introduced an indicator function okay they introduced an indicator function and what does this indicator function do what it does is that it becomes one if mu t minus one is less than zero so if you have error series where the place that the point that observa the observations are less than zero it, uh, it picks one this indicator function picks one and then the point that it turns out to be greater than zero it picks what zero so here you're going to have variable uh, a series of a series where the, the the observations that the mu t the lags are less than zero are negatives will go off the series okay so it will be turning to be one and then positives will be so for a leverage effect we will have what that coefficient being greater than what zero okay we'll have that coefficient being greater than zero so that will be a series now this series is generated from the error series itself so once you run the first regression then uh, you select where you have negatives in the series you place zero in the data okay then you leave the positives then you run the regression when you run the regression this coefficient which is the gamma will be what um, significant if it turns out to be significant then you are having a leverage effect in there now we require that alpha one plus what gamma will be greater than zero alpha one will be greater than zero for non-negativity purpose so we take an example of the ggr model so using monthly data of s p 500 that is from december 1979 to uh, June 1998. Estimating the GJR model, we obtained the following um, results. So this is the Y, and this is the indicator function. You can see a significant, significant difference from what zero. That's what an indication of leverage in the data. And then the sum of uh, I've forgotten about the conditions in the previous slide. Then you have the omega. And then that is the model so you can see the coefficients are all significant that is significant i think that is not what significant okay so it might not depend on what it's at all terms but it will depend on what the sigma squared lags okay so how do we demonstrate this in e-views so testing arch effect in e-views so the first step is to what estimate a linear model so that residuals can be what tested for arch effect so from the main menu select quick and then what then select estimate in the equation specification edit what editor input um rgb c a r1 so it's like you're estimating an armor model for the pound dollar returns so i'll come to that the next step is to click on view from the equation and then uh, window and then select the residual test. You can test for heteroscedasticity. Test type box, you can use what? Ash, okay. 
So the first step is to estimate a linear model to so that uh, the residuals can be tested for ash. And then from the main menu, select quick and then select estimate equation. In the equation specification, you specify. Now here is the returns on the uh, British pound dollar exchange rate. Okay, you have a, a pound uh, dollar exchange rate in one of the columns of the data series. So the next step is to click on view from the equation window and select residual test and then the heteroselasticity test. So test type box, choose arch and then the number of lags to include is five. So you add five. So you anywhere you see bold is what you indicate on the software. Okay. And then press okay. The output below um, shows the angel test results. So that's the output. So what does it tell you? It tells you that the residuals was regressed on its own lags. Okay, so which of the lags here looks um, significant? And you can see from the p-values, the first lag is more significant at 5% level. Okay, yeah, it's 5% level. It falls in the rejection regions. Okay, so in the end, it's autocorrelation with what? Lag of one. Okay, lag of one. Then you can see from the R square and then F statistics. So, so how do you estimate a gas model in E views? Okay. So open the equation specification dialog box by selecting quick and then select object, new object equation, select as from the estimation settings. Okay. So you can see it from here. So we select as from the estimating sessions. So we have the gas. Gas and then what tash. Then certain selects box. Okay, window is what screenshot. The window in the screenshot will open. Okay, assume you have the return on Japanese uh, yen, the dollar Japanese uh, relationship data in your work file. Then you can easily estimate the GJR and the EGAS model. And as you go to this place, you see the various models there. So if you click on this, um, arrow facing down you get the various types of what um, models that are in there and then here you indicate a method to be ash model that is the generic ash then you click on ok so this will be the outcome so you have the residual part and then the gas part of the equation the gas part being the sigma part and then that is the lack of the residual part and they all seem to be what significant looking at the p values so they fall in the rejection region. So the GAS11 can really fit the model. And that is the GAS11 model, as you can see from there. We have the constant, and then the sigma part, and then the residual lax part. Now, don't think about the R square. It looks smaller here, but that's more or less the maximum likelihood R square, because this equation is always estimated by the maximum likelihood approach. And it's quite. Um, it's kind of a pseudo R square. And then the IKX information criteria of selecting the various uh, models okay, is also indicated there. Then we have a hybrid again in cash and mean model. So we, in, in, in finance, we expect a risk to be compensated by higher, higher returns. Okay, So why not let the return of a security be partly determined by its risk? So how do you capture this model? So in, Le in Angel Lillian and Robbins, 19 suggested the arch M. So the arch means specification. A gas M model will be where we have the sigma and then we have, and then the mean. So you estimate this and then this is, has no constant volatility and that will be captured by the gas one one, the gas one one model. So the, Delta can be what? Interpreted as sort of what? A risk premium. So if you're able to estimate that, the delta becomes a risk premium. So that is the gas in mean. So what use are the gas type models? What do they use what do they use those gas type models for? So gas can gas model can be clustering effect since the conditional variance is autoregressive. So such models can be used for forecasting volatility. So you can use that to forecast volatility. That is the dynamics in the movement of asset returns. So we could show that 
the variance of yt or any series given the lack information depends on the variance of the error term given what the um, lag information on the error term so modeling sigma t will give us models and forecast for yt as well so variance forecast are additive over time variance forecast are additive over time so we come to the log likelihood ratio test estimate under the no hypothesis and under the alternative hypothesis that is the likelihood ratio test then compare the maximized value of the the log likelihood functions so we estimate the unconstrained model and achieve a given maximized value of the llf and denoted by lu so that's the unconstrained model log likelihood function you know i initially indicated how you can obtain the likelihood function and then estimate the model imposing the constraints so if you want delta or the gamma or the constant to be equal to zero it means you are restricting the model so if you are restricting the model then you are estimating a different model so the question is is it the likelihood function of the restricted or the likelihood function of the unrestricted that will be bigger and we compare that to the residual sum of squares and then on res residual sum of squares of the restricted model and then so is the restricted model log likelihood function less than that of the unrestricted so the lr test statistics is given by lr which is minus l r minus two so these are values that you obtain from the functions and then you compare it with the chi-square distribution um, critical values from the chi-square distribution table m being what the number of what restrictions if you indicate the number of restrictions then you can reject when the test statistics is greater than the values from the chi-square distribution table for the restriction so in depiction you can compare the testing procedures under the maximum likelihood that is the lr method okay log likelihood uh, uh test by this so we have the unrestricted and this and then the restricted you take the difference so different methods uses different uh, approaches some takes the slopes at each point in time okay and some takes the y values the difference between the y values and some takes the values between the estimated values as well so you have different types of methods here one some of them takes the slope so i can take a slope here and take a slope here. obviously the slope here is zero okay smaller so this is a likelihood function like a quadratic function and then i can take the difference between the estimated parameters or i can take between the likelihood log likelihood functions between the two estimates so how do we test based on this depiction so the vertical distance forms the basis of the log likelihood test so that that is um the likelihood ratio test okay that is the distance between um the vertical distance i mean this the distance between the restricted and then the unrestricted okay that is the uh, forms the basis of the likelihood test and then there's another test the valve test is based on comparison of the horizontal distance so like i was telling you the distance between the parameter and then what it estimate and then we have the lm test compares the slopes of the curves at the two points a and b so we know at the unrestricted mle which is l hat the slope of the curve is what zero okay so but it is what significantly steep at where we have the restriction okay so this formulation of the test is usually the easiest to estimate in maximum likelihood approach so in summary there are many types of nonlinear models so we have the ash and the gas we have the likelihood we have the switching and bilinear models which we did not do, do we did not do that this time but then i think in our next lecture series we'll have a look at that and then out of sample results suggest that nothing can accurately what predict volatility 
So we have to be careful in there. Thank you very much for your time.